Hello, everyone. Well, there's a slight inkling as to why boats may be part of a circular economy, but I'm going to try and take you through my life in the next 15 minutes, which is going to be quite a challenge. When you're a child, anything and everything seems possible. And the challenge is holding on to that as you grow up. And for me, as a four-year-old child, I had the opportunity to sail for the first time. I will never, ever forget the feeling of freedom that I felt when those sails hoisted. It was extraordinary. And I made my mind up there and then, aged four, that one day, somehow, I was going to sail around the world. I had no idea how to make that happen. I grew up as far away, far away from the sea as you can possibly get in the UK, but I had that goal, and I set about trying to make it happen. I saved my school dinner money. I left school at 17. I wrote 2,000 letters to companies trying to find a sponsor, knowing that was my only route to making this happen. So imagine how it felt just four years after leaving school to be sitting in a boardroom in front of someone who I knew could say yes. I knew could make that dream come true. And they did. And that created the most extraordinary eight years of my life, building two boats, Kingfisher, with which we won the Route de Rum and the Solo Transatlantic Race, then the Vendée Globe, that goal to sail solo non-stop around the world, we undertook in 2000, finishing in 2001. It was everything that I'd ever dreamt of. It was my dream life, my dream job, my dream everything. So much so that six months after finishing that first round-the-world journey, I decided to go again, not to race like the Vendée Globe, but to try to be the fastest person ever to sail solo non-stop around the world. This needed a very different craft, a much faster craft, a very powerful craft, and they're actually, because of the speed, quite dangerous. Just to give the boat some context, I could climb inside that mast right the way to the top. The loads were huge. And they're quite lively, they're quite wet, quite exciting to sail. Uh, they don't always stay the right way up. And no one knows that better than me because I was one of the five crew in this photo. Five seconds is all it took for the boat to be fine, and we were having lunch inside, well, two of us anyway, to being upside down when your world goes black because all the windows are underwater and you're trying to find one of your best friends who's trapped underneath the net, just like that. And so when you sail around the world on a boat, you manage everything that you have with you. You manage the energy in your batteries, you manage the food that you have, you manage everything because you're living in this tiny world that you're taking around the world as fast as you physically can. And when you're racing through those southern oceans... You're two and a half thousand miles away from the nearest town in iceberg territory. If help needs to get to you, because you break a leg or capsize, it'll take five days for a ship to get to you, and then five days, if they can get you on the ship, to steam you back to Australia, New Zealand, South America, South Africa, to a hospital. You really are isolated in the middle of nowhere. And no experience in my life could have ever connected me more to the notion of what finite really means. Because what I had on that boat really was all I had. There was no more. And I'd never, ever in my life translated that notion of finite, the finite that I felt on board, to the global economy, not once, until I stepped off the boat at the finish line. And I suddenly realised that our global economy is no different. It's powered by finite resources, materials, energy that we only have once in the history of humanity. And I began a new journey, a journey of learning, speaking to experts, scientists, CEOs, stepping into totally new territory I knew nothing about. The school I went to didn't even study economics. And yet here I was trying to understand how global economics functioned. And on this journey, I visited so many places. One actually was a coal-fired power station, just to see how energy is generated here in the UK, probably powering these lights in London now. And I remember standing in the burner, I remember standing on the top of the building, I remember this experience and thinking about coal as a resource and how it linked to my family, because my great-grandfather was a coal miner. Now, when you see that photo of him, you don't see today's generation. You see a really old photo. Nobody has trousers with a waistband quite that high in this day and age. It may come back. This is a wide conference, but who knows? But you see another era. Yet that's me with my great-grandfather. And by the way, they are not his real ears. <laughs> They're his spock ears he put on for his great-grandchildren. And I was very close to him. I remember listening to his mining stories. I remember him talking about the camaraderie underground, the pit ponies, that when they retired from the pits... The miners used to save their crust of their sandwiches. Extraordinary stories. And as I was going through this journey of learning, one place I went to was the World Coal Association. And there, in the middle of the homepage, several years ago, was, we've got about 118 years of coal left. And it really made me stop and think, because I thought, well, that's actually miles more than oil, the figures that we here talked about. And it's miles outside my lifetime. 
But when I did the calculation, I realized that my great-grandfather had been born 118 years before that year. Exactly. And I sat on his knee until I was 11 years old. And I realized it's nothing. It's nothing in time. It's nothing in history. It's just that. And it made me make the decision that I never thought I would ever make in my life. If you'd have asked me 10 years ago if I'd been doing anything other than sailing around the world, I would have argued I would be sailing forever. But I made the call to stop because I needed to understand a much greater challenge than taking a boat around the world, and that was how can our global economy really function in the long term? And you realize it's not just about the energy and the coal and the oil and the gas we hear talked about all the time. It's also materials, materials that we just have once, materials that we're using faster and faster, materials that no one makes anymore. The speed of increase of our use of materials is extraordinary, so much so that we've seen a century of price declines erased in a decade. There was an inflection point in 2002, and material prices are getting more and more expensive at a time when we reckon there are going to be at least 3 billion middle-class consumers coming online in the next 20 years, needing those resources, needing materials, deserving what we have, our IT capability, our connectivity, our transport. So the demand for these resources is going to increase. And to put that into perspective, and it's a figure that really shocked me, between January 2011 and January 2012, the average European car manufacturer saw a raw material price increase of 500 million euros in 12 months. That's about half the average operating profits wiped away just like that because of something they have no control over. Because our business models are so linked to a conveyor belt system. Our economy is driven by taking something out of the ground, making something out of it, and ultimately it gets thrown away. And yes, we do cycle some of the material. We do recycle some of it, but not by design. We try and get out what we can at the end of that system. And you can describe that, if you like, as a linear economy, an economy which runs in a straight line an economy where things fall off the end. And when I spoke to experts and scientists desperate to try and find some solution when I looked at the global economics, so many people were talking about the strategy being doing less, using less. We need to make a product using 5% less material, using 5% en less energy every year. And you play that out in the long term, and you realize that, yes, that buys you time. But when we're using more and more every year, it's not a solution in the long term, because you still run out in the end. So how can that global economy function. And then I came across some people who saw things very differently. A Welsh education expert, a German scientist who'd been working with a Dutch CEO, and they saw business models, they saw design, they saw the whole company structure in a very different way, a much more circular model. And as an example, the CEO had said to his entire business, I don't want to build a carpet, which made industrial carpet tiles, by the way, I don't want to build a carpet that's more efficient, I don't just want to build a carpet with less energy. I want to build a carpet that's made to be made again. I want that, that carpet to be designed for disassembly. I'd actually rather lease it because I want to guarantee I get it back because I'm going to build a machine that can disassemble it. We can then send the yarn back to the yarn suppliers who will depolymerize, repolymerize, and send it back to make the yarn of the next carpet, and the base will get melted down, and that base will become the base of the next carpet. And actually, we want to do that using entirely renewable energy by 2025. He totally changed his business. It was a total rethink of a system. It wasn't just changing design slightly, but everything that sat around the design, a systems level change. And carpet is very often a technical material, plastics coming from oil. You could think about the same model with cars or washing machines or planes where you design for disassembly, you can recover the materials. But there's also the biological aspects, food waste, human waste, agricultural waste. What if that was designed to cycle? What if our recovery mechanisms could keep that material at its highest value? and get it back to farms all over the world. And this, to me, was a very different model. This was a circular economy. This was an economy that maybe could function in the long term. And so three years ago, when we kicked off the foundation, we kicked off the foundation with a goal to accelerate the transition to that circular economy, working in three areas. Firstly, working in education to inspire a generation to rethink and redesign the future, to see there's a different way that things can function in the long term. The second area is working with business. Business can change now. You see that more than ever at this conference here in London. People with different ideas. Things can change now quickly, very quickly, and can almost accelerate off the scale. And the third area was on analysis. What is this worth to the global economy? Is this worth anything to the global economy? Does it cost more to the global economy? What were the questions? So the foundation, together with its four founding partners, went along to McKinsey six months in. And we asked them, 
Does this decouple grow from resource constraints? Does the circular economy deliver value for business and value for the broader economy? And this first report we looked at was based on the European Union and based on medium complexity goods. So we looked at things that cycle in more than one year, less than 10. And we took five signature products and divided them effectively into two categories. We took a light commercial vehicle, cotton as a material, cascading through the economy. We took a washing machine, and we took a mobile phone and smartphone, quite frankly, because we didn't think that they would deliver value in a circular economy. And during that study, when we broke these into two sides, we, we learned quite a lot that on the left you have biological, that would be cotton in this case, and on the right you have the technical products. And if you look at those loops, the outside loop is the least valuable loop, and the outside loop is recycling. Now, yes, it was economically very interesting to recycle the material, but the loops inside show also the different business models, remanufacturing, decomponentization, recovering parts, repairing, reselling. There's a huge amount of value that lies very close to that product that you build in the first place. And when we looked at this, we realized it really was that systems-level change, and a systems-level change that could, devalue, could deliver value on both sides. And to give you an example, one of those five studies was the washing machine. A washing machine, when it's made by a manufacturer today, will cost you about 27 cents a wash if it's your average low-end machine. A high-end machine will cost you about 12 cents a wash, but it costs us all more to buy it because there's much more R&D and much more material sitting within that machine. What if, rather than buying the machine, where you pay tax when you buy it, where you pay tax when you throw it away through landfill tax, what if you pay per wash? So you get a machine, it's guaranteed to work, someone's going to come and repair it, someone will upgrade it, someone will make sure it is the best machine from an energy perspective. You pay per wash, you pay less than you would if you had your low-end machine of today, and they make a third more profit. It's a win-win situation. And we looked at similar figures when it came to the light commercial vehicle, the smartphone, the mobile phone. If you can share where the value lies, everybody benefits. It's not a one-sided argument. And the top-line figure of that report, looking at the EU was that actually there was over 600 billion US dollars worth of value just to the EU per year, and that was only based on cycling 25% of products, components, or materials per annum. So it was a huge figure. We then went into the second report, looking at the faster-moving goods, consumer goods, within one year. Again, we thought this was a real challenge. This time we looked at the world. And really it was looking at packaging, textiles, and the materials which cycle quickly. This stuff, this stuff has massive value. This is part of a 3.2 trillion global market, which currently we only recover 20% of. $68 billion of textiles are lost into our economy every year because we have no system for recovering those materials. The stats were extraordinary. If you take one ton of food waste here in the UK, for example, within that one ton is $6 of fertilizer, $18 of heat, and $26 of electricity. There now for the taking. We don't recover it. We don't process this waste. Is it waste, in fact, or is it something of real value? And then we looked at what if you could recover all the agricultural waste, the food waste, um, farming waste, human waste, from all over the world. How much could you replace chemical fertilizer by, what we use every year to grow our crops? 2.7 times. If we could create that flow of materials in the form of biological materials in the study. So the stats were extraordinary. 700 billion US dollars to the global economy. Again, a huge figure. And again, this was conservative. So we've seen this massive increase in the circular economy since we created the foundation. It's been huge. We've now started to work with the World Economic Forum. We work with the Union, European Union. We have a business platform with 50 businesses from all over the world, including Coca-Cola, H&M, Ikea, Unilever, small emerging innovators, really small startups with extraordinary ideas, and regions, whole regions like Scotland, signed up to this program because they want to accelerate this transition. They really want to make this happen including our founding partners. There's partners in there at the beginning who have extraordinary goals. Philips, they're looking at revolutionising lighting, healthcare. We work with Cisco looking at how can IT enable a circular economy? How can it become the enabler through RFID tracking, through looking at where materials lie, through knowing what is where in the economy? We work with Renault on looking at the future of mobility. How can circular models unlock different, uh, different economic uh, models for Renault? And we work with Kingfisher, the first company to try to produce 1,000 products with circular credentials. And just a few case studies to finish. Renault, with their new fleet of electric vehicles, rather than buy the lithium in the batteries when you buy the car, you actually have that battery on a performance contract. You lease it effectively, and they will guarantee they will always replace it when it gets to 75% of capacity. 
They also have a remanufacturing site, which interestingly lies in France, takes broken engines, gearboxes, and fuel pumps from right across the Renault network and remanufactures them, ultrasonically cleans them, tests them to the same level as a new engine, and then once that engine is finished, it goes out of the door in a box saying genuine Renault parts. Costs you less, they make significantly more money. In fact, that's their most profitable factory in the world at the moment. Looking at turn two, very innovative. A company in Holland who provides office solutions, they went to Philips and said, I want 450 lumens at desk height in my office. I don't want to buy the lights, I don't want to pay the electricity. I just want the service. So they worked with Philips, they produced leasing lumens, Philips produced the, the most efficient lighting they could. They paid the electricity bill, in fact. And then when they get more efficient lighting, you know they'll come in, they'll change the lighting in your office because they pay the energy bill. Then they take the materials back in the form of the lights and they can be remanufactured into the lights of the future. Materials with memory. Joe Chiodo designed a bolt. So when the certain um, atmospheric conditions are met, the thread just disappears. Think about the scale of disassembling products if you can put technology like that within them. The National Physical Laboratory, circuit boards, you put them in warm water, all of the components come out of that circuit board. This is early stage. What if everything was designed for disassembly? What if your iPhone was? What if this clicker was? What if those TV screens were? What if you could disassemble everything? And they were designed at the beginning in the design brief to do just that. Vodafone Red Hot. You'd think, why would a mobile phone operator be in there? They're leasing phones through a Red Hot tariff. They don't call it leasing. It's a performance contract. You get the best kit every 18 months, guaranteed, in the contract. The old one goes back to Vodafone when you're done with it. But do we mind when the iPhone 9 comes out? Do we want the iPhone 8 still sitting in our drawer? Arguably not. That phone can go to someone else. It can get resold, remanufactured, disassembled, and importantly, ultimately, the, the materials recovered to go into the phones of the future. And then biological to finish, well, you could think, you know, we buy lots of cleaning products, for example. We buy the bottle that gets used once. It's quite a nice bottle. Everyone designs them to look beautiful because they want them to win on the shelf. That bottle just gets used once and then it becomes waste. Very little of that gets processed. What if the bottle stays for a while? What if it's a beautiful bottle? What if you could design a sachet that drops in, you add hot water, you mix it round, and then ultimately, when you shake it, that becomes your cleaning product. That sachet arrives via the post in a medium letter box. What if you could rethink that system? That is a biological component, the part that comes through the letterbox, and actually all the chemicals within that cleaning product are biologically uh, decompostable, so they disappear into the biological cycle. Totally rethinking the model. You don't have to go out and buy your washing products, they just come through the door in an envelope. Eben Bayer, famous within Wired for growing packaging, taking waste from farms and through mycelium, literally mushroom, growing packaging, now at price parity with styrofoam, and he's got clients such as Dell, incredible rethinking. That packaging will never become waste because it's designed to sit in that biological cycle. And when I think about the scale of trying to accelerate the transition to a circular economy, it's huge. We're talking about a different global economic model whereby products are designed to cycle, whereby we redesign the components of that economy. We look at different business models. In your average business, there is not a part of the business that the circular economy doesn't touch. But when I think about the scale of that challenge, I think about what happened in the life of my great-grandfather what he saw through his own eyes. When he was born, there were 25 cars in the world. They'd only just been invented. When he was 14, we flew for the first time in history. He remembered that. He talked to me about that. Now three times the population of the world back then fly every single year. When he was 45, we built the first computer. Many said it wouldn't catch on. Clearly it has. And just 20 years later, that room full of computer that was built with nuts and bolts and spanners was turned into a microchip. And that's huge compared to those that we have here today. Revolutionizing technology, making so much possible we thought was impossible. The first mobile phone wasn't that mobile, not by today's standards, but now it really is. And it's enabled different investments in different countries in the, in the, the um, infrastructure that allows people to communicate, totally. And as my great-grandfather left this earth, the internet arrived, if ever, there is a time in history when we can change our global economy. It's right now. Because we can have an idea in this room, and this is what this conference is all about, and in seconds, it can be literally shared with the rest of the world. Thank you. <laughs>